During the height of British colonial rule in Hong Kong, a haunting incident left an enduring mark on the tranquil landscape of Bremer Hill, a picturesque and upscale residential area. Welcome to the tragic account of the Bremer Hill murders. It was April 20th, 1985, when the lives of local British teenagers Kenneth McBride, aged 17, and Nicola Myers, aged 18, met a gruesome fate their promising lives were cut short by the merciless actions of a group of five young gangsters on Bremer Hill, Hong Kong. Kenneth McBride, found bound, beaten and strangled, bore the marks of over 100 bodily injuries, a haunting testament to the brutality of the crime. Meanwhile, Nicola Meyer's body, discovered half-naked, revealed a harrowing tale of agony, her broken jaw, dislodged eyeball, and evidence of a despicable act of sexual assault. Join us as we delve into the compelling tale and unravel the devastating events that scarred the tranquil slopes of Braemar Hill forever. <laughs> Kenneth McBride aged 17, and Nikolai Myers, aged 18, were standout students at Island School. Kenneth held several significant roles within the school, including serving as the president of the Students' Union, leading the rowing team, and being an active participant in the debate team. Described as intelligent and deeply respected within the school community, Kenneth garnered admiration from his former teacher, Chris Force. Meanwhile, Nicola was recognized for her intelligence, particularly in her keen interest in languages, nurturing an ambition to pursue a career as an interpreter. During her time in Hong Kong, she developed a deep affection for Chinese culture and became fluent in both Mandarin and Cantonese. Her peers admired her for her radiant and amiable nature. Both Kenneth and Nicola were highly popular figures at Island School, viewed as a golden couple. They actively participated in the school's debate and rowing teams and were known for exchanging poetic gestures atop the school roof. In the spring of 1985, on April 20, a Saturday afternoon, Kenneth and Nicola set out from Kenneth's family residence to enjoy a leisurely stroll in the serene Bremer Hill countryside, part of the Thaitam Country Park, which was close to Kenneth's family residence at Bremer Hill Mansions. Kenneth, having sustained a cycling injury that resulted in a broken collarbone, was confined to an arm sling, requiring a more leisurely pace for their day's journey. Finding a secluded spot on a quiet hillside pathway, they settled down to study for their A-level exams. Earlier on the same day, a group of five locals associated with the triad, namely Pang Soon Yi, Tam Si Foon, Xu Wai Man, Shong Yao Hang, and Wan Sam Lu, had gathered in the vicinity. Seeking amusement, they ventured out for some leisure, indulged in a few drinks, and sought extra money for further refreshments and food. Tang, leading the group, proposed the idea of stealing a cable from the government aerial station located on the mountain for additional monetary gain. Following numerous unsuccessful attempts to steal the cable, they redirected their efforts towards robbery. Tang, familiar with the area from living nearby in Hutt, guided them across the hill, the group spotted Kenneth and Nicola, and assuming the teenager's European background implied affluence, they decided to rob them for amusement. Tang divided the gang, approaching the couple from two different directions. Prior to engaging them, Pang obtained a broken wooden handle. Taking the lead, Pang directed the group to confront Kenneth and Nicola, inquiring if they possessed any money. However, upon discovering only one dollar in the possession of Kenneth and Nicola, it enraged the gang provoking a violent assault. Kenneth was restrained and subjected to a brutal beating with the wooden handle wielded by Pang. Amidst the chaos, Tam opportunistically snatched Kenneth's prized Nike shoes. Pang coerced the other four to participate in the attack, ensuring their involvement. Pang, dissatisfied with the force of the blows from Wan, Shong, and Xu, proceeded to strike Kenneth once more using the wooden stick joined by Tam, Placing the stick across Kenneth's neck, Pang directed Cheong and Xu to add pressure by jumping on it while being held by Pang and Tam. Pang expressed dissatisfaction, leading to a reversal of roles, with Xiong and Xu holding the stick while Pang and Tam applied pressure by jumping on it. Despite these actions, 
Kenneth remained alive. Tam then retrieved the arm sling cloth Kenneth was wearing, which, with Pang's assistance, was tightly wound around Kenneth's neck, after which Pang declared Kenneth deceased. Pang, after multiple attacks, made the chilling decision to end the lives of both Kenneth and Nicola to prevent potential identification. Pang then redirected his focus to Nicola and lunged at her with startling ferocity, reminiscent of a hungry animal. Nicola faced an appalling demand for sex from Pang, and when she refused, he forcibly dragged her downhill and sexually assaulted her. During Pang's assault on Nicola, the other four assailants remained nearby, smoking cigarettes and observing the scene. Tang's coercive threats compelled the rest of the group to partake in the assault, subjecting Nicola to prolonged torture using branches and a bottle. They replicated their earlier actions, placing a fractured segment of another stick across Nicola's neck, echoing the previous procedure performed on Kenneth. Following the killings, the group departed from the park, showing no regard as they callously destroyed the couple's belongings and scattered them on the hillside. Nicola, despite surviving for at least an hour after Kenneth's demise, was left gasping for breath as the gang left. Having endured the harrowing murder of her boyfriend and enduring brutal assault and torture, she struggled on but ultimately succumbed to her injuries, passing away in solitude. Family members of Kenneth and Nicola grew concerned when the couple did not return home as expected that night. Worried about their whereabouts, they initiated a search on the hillside around one in the morning, but were unable to locate them. As their worry intensified upon finding one of Kenneth's school books, the relatives reached out to the Royal Hong Kong Police to seek assistance in locating Kenneth and Nicola. The following day, on Sunday, April 21st, a jogger passing the hillside towards a bridge noticed what seemed to be two bodies lying on the bank and promptly alerted the police. The occurrence at Bremer Hill known for its luxury residences and scenic beauty, stood as an unexpected backdrop for a crime involving Western victims. Typically, violence in Hong Kong remained within the realm of triads and prior murders had been confined to local circles. The deaths of Kenneth and Nicola triggered an unprecedented police search, unparalleled in Hong Kong's history. Approximately 800 police officers and soldiers from British forces overseas Hong Kong were dispatched to conduct a thorough search of the crime scene, supplemented by an aerial search conducted via helicopter. Upon reaching the site, investigators discovered a grim scene. The two British students had been brutally beaten, tortured and killed. Kenneth bore multiple visible wounds across his body, including bruises around his neck, and was missing his Nike sports shoes. Nicola's body was discovered in a distressing state, partially unclothed. The brutality of the assault became apparent through the disturbing details. Nicola had suffered more than 500 blows during a sexual assault, resulting in severe brain hemorrhage, a broken jaw, and the dislodging of her left eyeball. Kenneth, too, had sustained over 100 injuries during the fatal attack. The presence of defensive wounds among the injuries indicated the likelihood of multiple perpetrators, as inferred by investigators. Among the findings were wooden sticks, suspected to be used as weapons and torn exercise books scattered across the hillside and nearby stream close to where the bodies were located. Nicola's torn clothing, along with personal items such as photos depicting life in London, were also recovered. Investigators detected traces of semen on Nicola's body and identified partial fingerprints on the torn books and sticks. Despite the abundance of evidence collected, the limited progress in forensic science during that time hindered the accumulation of enough conclusive evidence to identify the perpetrators. Additionally, a bloodied branch with Nicola's hair, analyzed for fingerprints, yielded no success, potentially due to inadvertent handling by the police, compromising the evidence. Following the tragic murder of Kenneth McBride and Nicola Myers, Hong Kong authorities launched an extensive investigation to identify potential suspects. They meticulously scrutinized every police station, officer-handled cases, and incidents involving multiple perpetrators to locate and question individuals of interest. Approximately 18,000 individuals underwent interviews, including door-to-door -door inquiries and discussions with known triad members. Despite offering a $50,000 reward, the police remained without any breakthroughs. 
Several months later, an anonymous Hong Kong businessman generously donated $500,000 to the Royal Hong Kong Police, prompting a surge in tips from individuals enticed by the substantial financial reward. The perpetrator responsible for the tragic killings, Pang, grew increasingly anxious as the case garnered widespread media attention. Seeking financial assistance, he turned to his triad boss, tempted by the significant cash incentive. The triad boss promptly contacted the police after Pang's approach. During subsequent discussions, the triad boss disclosed that Pang Soon Yi, one of his followers, had confessed to the murders. In November 1985, the Organized and Serious Crime Bureau initiated an operation to locate Pang, the alleged perpetrator. After several weeks of intensive efforts, Pang was successfully located and brought in for questioning. During subsequent interviews, Pang confessed his involvement in the murders and disclosed the identities of his four accomplices. This crucial information led to the apprehension of the five suspects in the brutal murders on November 27th and 28th, 1985. Pang Soon Yi, 24, Tam Si Foon, 20, Chu Wai Man, 25, Shung Yao Hang, aged 17, and Wan Sam Long, aged 16. Additionally, Nike sport shoes resembling Kenneth's were found in the possession of Tam Si Foon, serving as significant evidence presented in court. After the manhunt concluded, all individuals were detained for interrogation. Detectives employed various techniques and expertise to elicit cooperation and information. Despite the detectives being convinced of the suspect's involvement, there was a lack of concrete evidence linking them to the crime, necessitating further evidence before proceeding to court. The aim was to secure confessions to strengthen the case against the five individuals. The suspects underwent multiple interviews across different police stations over several months, after an extensive period of seven months, they each provided substantial and coherent statements outlining the events of April 20, 1985, and confessed to the murders during police interrogations. Their accounts mutually supported each other's testimonies. As part of the interrogation procedure, investigators organized a reenactment of the murder, wherein all five individuals voluntarily participated at the crime scene. These visits were recorded through filming and thorough documentation. Despite their involvement in detailing the crime on video and joining the reenactments, all five initially entered pleas of not guilty. However, in September 1986, the youngest individual, Wan Sam Lung, while in custody, had a change of heart, confessed to his involvement, and agreed to cooperate with the prosecution. Due to his age, he received a detention order at Her Majesty's pleasure, resulting in an indefinite prison sentence. Before the tragic incident, most of those involved had clean records with minor offences. Shung's upbringing involved being abandoned by his family at a young age and later placed in an orphanage. Reunited with his abusive father during adolescence, Shung left school at 14 and worked in various low-paying positions including operating ferry doors. After losing his job and being rejected by his father, he found himself adrift, eventually being approached and recruited by Pang. Another member, Wan, worked as a cook in a local restaurant. The ringleader, Pang, held sporadic jobs and had a minor position within the Fukiehing Triad Society. Known for his aggressive demeanor, Pang had a reputation as a bully and a low-ranking member within the group functioning as a soldier. As the trial approached, authorities amassed substantial evidence, including testimonies from 37 witnesses, one of whom was Wan Sam Lung. Additionally, there were cautionary confessions from the defendants and video reenactments of the crime by the accused themselves. However, the available physical evidence, such as fingerprints and blood groupings, was not deemed sufficient to sway the jury especially given the absence of forensic DNA analysis. Detectives were concerned about linking the defendants to the double murder based on this evidence shortfall. The trial proceedings at the High Court began in late November 1986, drawing renewed media attention as the public sought answers about the students' brutal deaths. The prosecutor vividly described the brutality of the murders and the victims' injuries during the trial's opening. One's witness's testimony in particular, delineated the roles played by the accused in the murders. After 56 days and five hours of deliberation, 
on January 20th, 1987, at 6.5 p.m. The jury unanimously delivered guilty verdicts. Initially, Pang, Tam, and Chu received death sentences, which were later commuted to life imprisonment in 1993 with the governor in council's permission. As for Chong and Wan, both born in 1968 and underage at the time of the crime, they were sentenced to detention at Her Majesty's pleasure. Following the transfer of sovereignty over Hong Kong to China in 1997, amendments were made to the law regarding underage offenders held indefinitely. Chief Executive Tung was tasked with determining the sentences for Wan and Chung. Seeking forgiveness for Wan, his parents appealed to the McBride and Myers families. In 1998, the families publicly announced their forgiveness for Wan and appealed to Chief Executive Tung for a reduction in his sentence, which he granted. This led to a reduction in one's sentence to 27 years and Xiong's to a minimum of 30 years. However, Wan was released on September 28, 2004, after serving two-thirds of his term, publicly expressing his gratitude for the forgiveness granted to him and pledging to reintegrate fully into society. He was offered clerical work at a law firm through the government's Criminal Rehabilitation Service. In 2004, a change in the law prompted a review of Chung's prison term, resulting in the court converting his sentence to 35 years in 2005, despite Cheung's subsequent appeal for a sentence reduction similar to Wan's. The court denied his request on April 6, 2006, citing the severity of the crime. Nevertheless, against the odds, Cheung was released in December 2007 and found employment as an inspection worker at a public utility. As for the gang leader, Pang, and another triad member, Xiu, they remain incarcerated, while Tam passed away in prison at the age of 45 due to cancer. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. Let us know in the comments if there are any true crimes or unsolved mysteries you'd like us to explore. And as always, stay safe out there. Until next time,